see. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robin Wansley, and I am the chair of the Administration and Enterprise Oversight Committee. Um, I'm going to call to order our regular meeting for Monday, February 26, 2024, and I'll have the clerk call the roll now. Councilman, <coughs> excuse me, Councilman Vita. Present. Allison. Here. Cashman. Present. Chukta. Present. Vice Chair Palmasano is absent. Chair Wansley. Present. We have five present. Awesome. All right. Let the record reflect that we have quorum. Uh, colleagues, I'm going to move the consent item uh, first. We have 26 items, which I will now read for the record. Number two is a passage of resolution related to gift acceptance from Communities First Infrastructure. Ooh, sorry, I'm missing one. Wait, no, sorry. Uh, Communities First Infrastructure Alliance of Travel and Lodging Expenses. Number three is accepting bid for asphalt, sorry, hot mix asphalt. Number four is accepting bid for traffic marketing thermoplastic. Five is accepting bid for phone system maintenance. Six is authorizing contract with Cali America for online permitting services. Seven is authorizing a contract with Zan Associates for layout, engineering, and design services for the Northside Greenway Phase 1 and 2 project. Number eight is authorizing a contract amendment with Content Architects LLC for website services consulting. Number nine is authorizing a contract amendment with States Manufacturing for the Fridley Campus Electrical Rehabilitation Construction Project. 10 is authorizing a contract amendment with CDM Smith for engineering, design, and construction oversight services for the Fridley Campus Electrical Rehabilitation Project. Number 11 is authorizing a contract amendment with Pillsbury Winthrop Shaw Pittman LLP for continued IT sourcing consulting services. 12 is authorizing contract amendments with change equals opportunity and change starts with community for youth group violence intervention work, also known as YGVI. Number 13 is authorizing a contract amendment with Lockridge Grindle Nguyen PLLP for legal panel services. 14 is approving legal settlement Mark Steele versus uh, the city of Minneapolis and Irvin D. Hetchell. And then items 15 through 27 are all legal settlements related to compensation claims. Um, I also missed item number one, which is actually, no, sorry, the, my transcript shows up a little bit different, but those are all the items before us. Um, with that, I will uh, move them for discussion and I will let folks know I am using uh, speaker management just to keep better tabs of uh, people's uh, you know, questions, um, but yes, we'll see if there's any discussion on any of these items. There's none. All right, well, I will then move approval of the consent agenda. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those uh, not in favor, say nay which I will note for public record, I am on all, uh, I on all except items 14 through uh, 26. Um, as again, these are public, uh, actually uh, legal settlement claims. Um, that's gonna total over $2 million. And we've had lots of conversations about worker compensation claims um, and still deciding and exploring ways in which we can uh, hold uh, officers accountable with documented histories of lying uh, on public who are receiving these claims. We're still working with staff to figure out next steps around that. So just wanted to offer uh, some context as to why I won't be supporting items 14 through 24. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I just wanted to confirm you said um, all the workers' compensation claims 15 through 27? 14 through 24, sorry. Oh, 14 through 24, okay. Yes. Thank you. That said, all those items um, are approved and move forward. That moves us on to the next part of our um, agenda, which is discussion. Um, at this point, we have, sorry, my transcript is a little bit weird. <laughs> 
We're going to kick off with uh, a presentation on item 27, which is improving workforce uh, culture legislative directive, which is uh, the one that I brought forward, and I'll provide some uh, context uh, <coughs> as to why I author this legislative directive to see what recent steps have or have not been taken to ensure that the city is living up to its goal of being a workplace that is equitable and productive for all workers and what steps we can take going forward uh, because this issue relates directly to lived experience of city employees and I have also included a public comment period so that the public has the opportunity to speak for themselves about this issue. Um, I want to note that many city employees have spoken about experiencing uh, racism, misogyny, and toxic work environments at departments throughout the city. Uh, this has ranged from employees under the former city coordinator, uh, Heather Johnson speaking out publicly about the toxic and racist work environment in that office, uh, to a female uh, MPD officer suing the city for sexual harassment by her colleagues. And there's so many other examples, um, but I won't name them in this uh, instance. There are also employees who have left or been forced out and who have not spoken publicly about their experiences for a uh, fear of retaliation. But one way we could start to create a healthier and safer work environment is by encouraging public conversations about uh, the realities at the city rather than suppressing them. And I really hope that today's public comment period can provide an opportunity for some of those conversations that typically happen behind closed doors to happen more publicly. Uh, transparency is the first step to accountability and improvement. And I am committed to using this committee to improve the workplace culture at the city. And I look forward to working with my colleagues, city staff, uh, city employees, our employee resource groups, labor, as well as residents uh, to continue carrying out that work. Um, and with that, I will open the public comment period. And as of now, the clerk has given me the sign up sheet. Um, each uh, individual will have two minutes uh, to share their piece. Um, but the first individual signed up, I have Marquita Stevens. If you would come to the floor. Yes. Thank you, Councilperson Wamsley and committee members for making space on your agenda for community responses spurred by the dismissal of Alberta Gillespie as Director of Civil Rights Department, City of Minneapolis. The timing of the dismissal and seemingly immediate news coverage while Ms. Gillespie was on vacation raises serious questions about one, the integrity of the work environment, as you've already spoken to, and two, the intent of the action. Given an African American person will not be leading the work as a representative of the city's interface with the monitoring committee soon to begin. This coupled with the circulation of about 19 African Americans thought to be forced out of their positions at the city gives cause for this committee to make inquiries formally to determine if there are personnel measures that should be overhauled or if it's an issue of a hostile work environment ongoing. Hiring an independent consultant to look into these matters should result in a thorough investigation and reassure the public that the oversight you are elected to provide over the city's operations is working. There are larger issues at play here that the termination of a political appointee brings forth. There appears to be a crisis of governance regarding civil rights, how behavior is interpreted and by whom raises diversity, equity, and inclusion questions about discrimination. Turbulence in the country around DEI seems to have raised its head in, many, in Minnesota. The mayor's office is taking full responsibility and wants to be held accountable for this crisis of governance, hence the appointment of one of his direct reports as interim director. But we need full clarity. Meeting metrics is not the mandate coming out of the catastrophe of George Floyd. We're curious as to the guiding vision addressing equity and equality in Minneapolis. The answer is bigger than the speed of generating data. But it may be unearthed in this committee's examination of the patterns and practices governing city personnel. We're con concerned about these larger issues, how they will be addressed even as we move forward with the monitoring work underway. 
and hope by sharing with this committee and requesting closer examination, it'll mark the beginning of a work that'll benefit us all. Thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Marquita Stevens. Uh, number two, we have, and I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, Mark Makita Zulu. Makeda, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, greetings, Chair and Committee. Uh, my name is Makeda Zulu, and I am an over 50 year old resident of North Minneapolis in the Fifth Ward. Um, and so I'm coming to talk to you um, in the names of Tysel Nelson, Jamar Clark, um, Alberta Gillespie. Um, I was surprised to receive an email um, describing uh, the, or declaring the dismissal and the details for ending this contract. However, there's an opportunity here. The opportunity is for the city to present a report on the practices of hiring, promotion, complaints, dismissal, dismissal, discipline, and money spent on settlements by race, gender, by department, and supervisor so that we can create a real plan and possibly uh, shake up this, uh, uh, our staff. Um, this has been a hostile environment for quite a while. Um, and even though you had a department that is now uh, no longer exists, recast that was uh, created to help uh, fix this, um, this problem in the city, this hostile environment, that committee no longer exists. The way it was uh, dis uh, disbanded was not a good way. Um, we have also lost uh, Sean Pierce Lassiter. So this, this has been going on much longer than even those folks. Um, but it's time to make a change um, because this city work, should work for all of us. And the people who work for the city should feel welcome um, and, not feel, um, and not be publicly shamed. I don't think that's a value of Minnesota. Um, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Marketa. Uh, our third uh, Testifier, we have Thomas Berry. Good afternoon, and thank you all <clears throat> for giving us the chance to speak. I'm here to speak on the behalf of uh, the community, and the dismissal of uh, Alberta Gillespie was one of those things that was like a gut punch to the community. This is the second time in a whole year calendar that we've had a dismissal of a black appointed official and the way that they were talked about in the papers is uncalled for. It's unprecedented. And when we had the situation with Officer Timberlake, I don't recall anyone being outed as such. There was no uh, finger pointing uh, to the person who hired him, nor have we had any other finger pointing. It's amazing to me that the DEI positions that were created around George Floyd uh, to make sure that we don't have any more civil unrest, no more discrimination, no more racism, is all but going away. It's fading in the sunset, and the dismissal of uh, Ms. Gillespie is a great example of that. You guys have talked about these issues that are happening in the city and what's going on with the employees, but it sounds like it's riding from the head down. If we have a mayor that's behaving in this pattern, then what do we expect from the other people who are working up under him and his leadership in the city? Our position, especially as African Americans, is always to speak truth to power. Once we stop doing that, then we stop being a vital part to that. That's what Ms. Gillespie was doing. No one should be dismissed for doing their job. She doesn't work for the mayor, she works for the citizens of Minneapolis, as we expect you all to do, work for the citizens of Minneapolis. And I will say this because I did walk, I did bump into uh, Ms. Wamsley here maybe a couple of months ago when I did have a meeting with the mayor and he didn't even know who was in charge of internal affairs, even though he knew it was him. And this is what I'm talking about. The idea that someone can boldface lie to the citizens, yet out other members of his staff, whether they're dismissed or they're working for him. The accountability starts with him, and we hope that you guys offer that oversight to him as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, our next... Uh, speaker is Janet Kitu, and I'm sorry if I also mispronounced your last name. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, my name is Janet Kitui, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak here. Uh, I come here to in support of 
Miss Alpada Gillespie, and not only that, I equally have been an employee of the city of Minneapolis, and less than a year ago, I was dismissed in and circumstances that seem to be forming a pattern. So when we ask to examine the underbelly of the most progressive council member in the United States, where we come to see uh, change happen, change is not happening. So if we need to change that, we need to examine the structures of which we as black employees are operating in this city. Ms. Gillespie, Gillespie in 2020, mobilized 20 or almost 40 black women to run for public office. I was one of those women. She truly cried, as we all cried for George Floyd, who was murdered in this city. And we cried for George's mother, who wasn't here to mourn that death. So we came in here with whole heart of changing the system. But when you're at the door of just being able to make that come a reality, you're dismissed. It really begs a lot to be uh, said. I don't have much to say, but I am begging you that you look into what's really going on in the city of Minneapolis, because we are at the epicenter of the racial healing or racial uh, animosity in the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Janet. Um, I also would like to remind the public, if you would like to sign up and speak and haven't already, please see our clerks over to uh, the right-hand side, well, my right-hand side, um, over here in the corner. Um, but with that, we just have one more uh, individual who have signed up, and that person's name is Cheryl Carter. Thank you, uh, everyone. Um, my name is Cheryl Carter. I am not uh, a homeowner here in Minneapolis, but I'm an active um, uh, participant in politics in the Twin Cities. I am here also in support of Alberta Gillespie, but I'm here to present to you, for the record, a statement from the City of Minneapolis First Community Safety Commissioner Cedric L. Alexander on the departure of Civil Rights Director Alberta, um, Alberta Gillespie. He goes to say, as the City of Minneapolis first Commissioner of Community Safety Director, Gillespie warmly greeted me, one of the first to extend a welcoming hand upon my arrival. My observation of, Dr. of Director Gillespie is that she took proactive measures to ensure that those most impacted by unconstitutional policing were not just included, but actively involved in discussions. Even before my arrival, Director Gillespie had organized a virtual meeting with these community members who often felt marginalized. Additionally, she facilitated a meeting between myself and the entire OPCR staff. Early in my tenure as commissioner, aiming to foster a strong working relationship. Throughout my term, Director Gillespie consistently demonstrated her unwaveringly commitment to constitutional policing through various initiatives and actions. Losing someone of her caliber and dedication is a significant setback for accountability and the progress of police reform, given her lifelong history of advocating for civil rights. Despite facing internal challenges and reported lack of support in carrying out of her sworn duties, Director Gillespie remains steadfast in her unwavering commitment to operating with integrity. She made substantial strides in enhancing the operations of OPCR. As the former commissioner, I found her to be an outstanding collaborator internally and externally. Her integrity was unmatched and her work ethic was exemplary. Her departure is a loss for all who strives for a meaningful police reform in the 21st century. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Cheryl. And as of now, that's everyone who has signed up to give public comment. Um, I'll give a last minute uh, pitch again. If you would like to make comment, please sign up. 
All right, I see no one moving. Um, I see no one else wishing to speak. I will now close uh, the public comments um, and see if there's any uh, questions or discussion from committee members. All right, I see none. Um, before I move approval of my legislative directive uh, that gives um, an overview of our practices within HR and protocols or request information about those, um, I do wanna give some additional uh, context around what led me to bring this forward in the first place. Um, my office has been working um, on this issue around workplace culture for over two years now. Um, this work originally stemmed from concerns related to unchecked racist culture within MPD, as well as concerns that dozens of city staff share publicly uh, during the Heather Johnson public hearing related to her appointment to the former uh, COO position in 2022. Um, during this con these conversations with staff, um, it was clear that, that there was a lack of, of effective policies and protocols that was inflaming a toxic work environment um, and work culture here at the city. And my office had initial conversations with city staff about what a mandatory uh, reporting policy could look like, which will require employees to report when they witness uh, other employees engaging in harassment or misconduct. Uh, these conversations related to that policy development um, also had to be paused several times because many of the staff who have been offering support um, to my office in developing this policy had left themselves. Um, additionally, I know that my colleagues received an email from Mayor Fry uh, earlier before this committee uh, regarding my legislative directive, and I have asked the clerks to upload that email for public record. Also, committee members have a copy of it in front of you. Um, and in response to it, I would like to take a minute to read my legislative directive for the public record, and then I would encourage the public to read it, as well as Mayor Fry's response, which again, all of this will be uploaded to LIMS. So my legislative directive on workplace culture um, asks for information on, this is point number one, uh, update on any specific policy or operational changes to improve culture, conduct, and quality recruitment within departments that provide public safety services since 2022. Point number two is an overview of any changes in policies or practices related to the city's anti-discrimination, harassment, and retaliation procedures since 2020. Number three is asking for, any, uh, asking for information on any recommendations and changes to create a healthier culture within our workforce to support recruitment and retention efforts. 3A asks for analysis on potential policies that implement and enforce a mandatory reporting system and require city workers to report cases of harassment or misconduct witnessed or experienced by employees or members of the public. 3B asks for any updates on changes related to the recommendation made as a result of the 2022 hiring and promotion audit. Number four is an overview of how exit interviews are conducted how data is compiled, and how data from exit interviews influences policy changes in departments. Item five asks for current data and trends related to workplace complaints, including a breakdown of the identified most common issues. Um, we ask for this information, including any proposed changes or policy implementations, along with a potential fiscal needs assessment to the AO committee no later than uh, April 29th, 2024. So that's the legislative directive. And in response to this, and I'll summarize Mayor Fries's response, um, he made it very clear that he deeply disapproved of my legislative directive and also ascribed Ill, Ill motives to my attentions behind it. Um, instead of promoting transparency, the mayor and his executive staff team regularly attempts to stifle conversations. We just saw this last cycle in response to me asking the commissioner to clarify contradictory statements he made, and instead he pleaded the fifth. Um, and in response to that legislative directive where I asked for information where he pleaded the fifth, um, you know, it's very clear that we got, again, another response to stifle that conversation. 
And in response to this directive, which is meant to shape the committee's work as it relates to hiring and retention, the mayor has declared that even posing the question is unfortunately, and I quote from his letter, uh, it's geared towards sowing discord. And at worst, it's an attempt from elected officials, sorry, elected members to actively harm the city's ability to recruit and retain public servants by diminishing their work. To look at this legislative directive that I just read and respond defensively and ascribe negative intent follows the administration's line of defending and deflecting. And I really encourage the mayor and his staff to re reflect on why simple inquiries into their practices result in such a continued defensive response. But regardless of that, I just want to also affirm or affirm to the public that despite the administration's resistance in engaging in good faith conversations with the members of this body who do make inquiries into the work of the administration, I will remain steadfast in the oversight work that is within this committee's jurisdiction. And I will continue to utilize all tools of the legislative body to ensure that we are being transparent to the public and actually solve problems to the best of our ability. So with that, I will ask for a second for my legislative directive. Second. Awesome. And then I see uh, Council Member Ellison in queue. Uh, thank you, Chair Wansley, and thank you for uh, the legislative directive. I'll be, I'll be supporting it. Um, but I mostly wanted to address just uh, the folks who came and gave testimony about, uh, specifically about uh, um, Alberta Gillespie, and I see Alberta's here today, and, um, and just wanted to, to thank you for your service to the city. I, you, know, you know, it's always a weird situation where you don't want to comment on things that are outside of your purview, right? I am not qualified to, to know whether there was, was or was not cause to, to, to move on from Director Gillespie's uh, leadership. What I am, I think, qualified to say is that your integrity is, is, is unquestionable uh, and, and, that, and that when people move on from the city, they should be allowed to do so with their dignity intact. Um, you know, and, and I feel like it is my opinion that that was not allowed to happen. There have, there's always whispers of people who have, there have been whispers uh, of, of other folks who have left with, with literal accusations of impropriety, right? And they're allowed to leave with their dignity. They're allowed to go find new jobs. They're allowed to go continue their careers. Um, and when I read some of the, 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 the reporting, you know, it kind of dawned on me. Here's Alberta Gillespie is somebody who is highly qualified, somebody who's contributed to the, the region in, in a really meaningful way for years. Um, you know, how, how are... Um, how is somebody supposed to go find work when they're being labeled as a, uh, uh, a direct and imminent threat to reform? Um, that, is, uh, that is an inappropriate accusation, in my opinion. And, uh, and so, uh, again, maybe, you know, who knows? I wasn't there. I wasn't, you know, uh, I'm not on the administrative side. I can't say whether there was cause to, to, to let the director go or to move on from, the, with, uh, from, from your leadership. What I can say is that the way you go about doing that um, is, to, uh, is to ensure that people can leave with their dignity intact. And so uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I felt like that was compromised here in this, in this instance. And um, you know there are folks in the city, across the city, but certainly folks on this dais who recognize your leadership and your power here. Uh, and so just thank you for your service. And, uh, and again, just uh, I can't apologize on behalf of the whole institution, but, um, but just apologies to how, uh, how things were rolled out. Thank you, Council Member Ellison, and I will also echo uh, gratitude for our community members and community leaders who showed up um, at 1.30 today, it's a work day, um, and made time to share uh, your concerns and thoughts and perspectives about um, broadly, you know, issues with our HR practices and also blatantly how it relates to a trend around um, racism. Um, and a trend around employees of color, black women, continuously being pushed out of this city in a very public and in a very demonizing way that, as Council Member Ellison highlighted, has not been extended to other uh, city employees who have had um, actually documented um, actions that, you know, were problematic to the administration. 
Um, so again, I just want to say thank you all for showing up today. Um, it's your thoughts and your concerns that also went into my consideration um, in bringing this legislative directive, but also knowing that once again, this has been building upon work that I and I know a number of council members have really advanced to evaluate our HR practices so that this can be um, a employer of choice and that everyone who comes here actually knows they're welcomed. They're not going to be faced with threats of retaliation or threats of being pushed out or silenced or being repressed for doing their jobs and doing their jobs well. So with that, um, I, I had a you. I see someone else in queue, and it is Council Vice President Chuck Thai. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll start with saying I know in your comments earlier you mentioned that um, you know a copy of the the mayor's letter uh, would be attached in limbs um, where all of our agendas are publicly posted along with um, information on each item and just wanted to share that uh, the, the mayor's letter is now attached to the LIMS file for, for those that are interested in, in reading that in more detail. I'll just add, um, you know, I the, the HR audit on uh, hiring and promotions, you know, that was the subject of a lot of conversation in the audit committee um, last year and I know a number of actions had, have been taken to rectify uh, some of the um, risks that were um, documented in that audit. Um, and I think this legislative directive, it's really important to remember that this, this legislative directive isn't about one person that has worked within this enterprise um, in the past or in the present. This is about a larger pattern and, and you know, I'm just, I'm reading the language that you wrote. I know you're someone who's always very thoughtful and careful about the words that you choose. Um, and I'm reading this as something that's about um, all of the current and former employees that um, have served Minneapolis residents in their respective roles um, and the way that they um, are able to uh, access this workplace and the way in which we are able to, con to be an employer of choice, but also the way that um, our employees that carry marginalized identities are, are treated with, with dignity and respect in the workplace. I know that's something that we want every person in every workplace to experience. Um, and I think it's really important for this committee and for the council as, as the oversight body in this enterprise to take our role seriously and make sure that every person in, in every department, whether they're um, on the front lines of um, you know, filling potholes in public works or leading departments, um, that they are able to do their work with dignity and that they are supported in the ways that they deserve in carrying out their public service. So um, I'm really excited about this legislative directive. I think it's a very appropriate next step coming out of, it's been you know a long time since the um, HR audit has been in place and I know there are a number of things that have happened. So just bringing that stuff up um, on the public record and, and also wanna join council member Ellison in, in thanking um, I'll just modify what I'm going to say here a little bit and thanking all of our, our employees for their service, um, current and former, and to those who've had um, negative experiences as they have served or continue to, um, you know, know that this committee is, is taking the work of ch improving the, the culture in this workplace really seriously. We know how it affects the services that residents receive and, um, and beyond just caring about our employees um, as leaders of this enterprise, we know that your work directly touches the residents we represent to and, and this is connected to, to that work. Thank you. Thank you, Council Vice President. I see uh, Council Member Cashman in queue. Thank you, Chair Wansley. Um, I haven't been privy to the work uh, workplace culture very long here at the city of Minneapolis, so I'm grateful for a chance to learn about our HR policies in a presentation. I think it's important that we continuously monitor and evaluate our progress towards goals. And so I'll be supporting your legislative directive for that reason. And I would also like to ask Chair Wansley to um, explain a little bit point 3A in the legislative directive about mandatory reporting system and what the goal of that and what, what your thinking is around that part of the LD. Yes, uh, thank you, Council Member Cashman. Um, as I shared a bit in my opening um, statement, 
um, my office had worked throughout last term with a number of employees who also left the city um, on a mandatory reporting policy, which would require employees to report when they witness other employees engaging in harassment or misconduct. Um, so again, knowing that, as I mentioned earlier, we've had um, city employees leave, like a um, woman identify a former MPD officer who uh, experienced sexual harassment from her, from her colleagues in MPD, we end up paying out a settlement related to that. If we could have had a mandatory you know, reporting policy in that instance, other folks who witnessed that type of treatment of that colleague, like could there have been a reporting system so that there could have been documentation, there could have been follow-up, there could have been policies in place to make sure that those who engaged in it, of course, was held accountable. And then again, protocols or practices could be put in place to make sure it did not happen you know, further. So that is typically the aim of mandatory reporting practices is it's an intervention um, you know, mechanism to stop um, dynamics that lead to toxic, hostile work environments. Yeah, and if I could just ask a follow-up question. I mean, I know that um, our ethics procedures don't require you to put your name to file an ethics complaint, and so I'm wondering about mandatory reporting if folks have to declare their name or if they can have sort of whistleblower protections and prevent retaliation if they do come forward to report an incident. Thank you, Council Member uh, Cashman. So your question is also somewhat answered by three, um, well, sorry, point two and three A, because essentially is evaluating what do we have on the books? Because I can say, I don't know as of now, what is the protocol? So that's why I'm requesting information around what do we have on the books right now around anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, uh, anti, you know, retaliation procedures, and how that's guiding our protocols and, and policies in instances where harassment is happening and it's been witnessed. So that's the purpose of this LD. Thank you. Yeah. All right, I see Council Vice President Chuck back in queue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just to add to Councilmember Cashman's question, I think it's it, it's a really really important one to ask these um, to, to, for us to be thinking ahead around um, you know mandatory reporting and what's the impact on the person who um, may find themselves in the position of of um, reporting something that they witnessed. Um, this is something that um, some employees within our city are already subject to. So, for example, um, you know, within the Minneapolis Police Department and the settlement agreement with the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, like I know there are specific provisions in there around mandatory reporting when um, when an employee witnesses another employee engaging in unlawful behavior. And so, I think it is. Um, I think it's really important for us to be thinking also uh, as uh, an enterprise about how are all of our employees, regardless of what role they have in our city, um, held to the same standard. Thank you. I absolutely agree with that, Council Vice President. Um, and I don't see anyone else in queue. Um, with that, I will move this legislative directive uh, for approval. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those not in favor say nay. The ayes have it. That item is approved and will be car uh, carried forward. Thank you, colleagues. We're going to move on to item 28 of our discussion section, uh, which is related to collective bargaining agreements. Um, Minneapolis Association of Fire Chiefs 2022 and 2023 through 2024. Uh, five. So it's authorizing a bargaining agreement with the Minneapolis Association of Fire Chiefs. Um, I believe we have staff here to give a brief overview of what is um, included in this agreement and invite them to step forward. Good afternoon, Ch Chair Wansley, Council. Thank you for having us. I also, uh, my name is Rashida Deloney, Director of Labor Relations, like you know who I am. Um, I also have Chief Van Bickle uh, assisting me from uh, the fire department just to uh, certainly uh, outline the details of this agreement we reached. Um, it's uh, 
a bridge agreement, which means that we were able to get this uh, labor agreement caught up. It was severely expired and uh, a matter of priority to get to the table. Um, we actually did and were able to reach an agreement without having to go to other measures, which is uh, mediation and such. Um, the first agreement covers uh, the term of January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, 2022. Second, Des January 1st, 23 through December 31st, 2025. Um, we did an assessment on wages to ensure that we are market competitive and, uh, in taking a look at other jurisdictions, fires departments, also to meet up to the, the city's um, desire to be a, an employer of choice and to you know attract and retain uh, staff in this unit. Um, this unit contains a number of uh, 25 employees, um, diverse in the way of 28% uh, female, 12% being of color. Um, in terms of economics, uh, we, uh, for the first term, we were able to um, reach an agreement of 2.5%, which is in line with the other contracts that we were able to negotiate for that year, uh, followed by the second term, 2023 through 2025, at 25 two and a half, with an additional 4% market adjustment, which goes back to the research conducted to ensure that we are market competitive and uh, in an effort to um, attract and retain. Uh, the same methodology was used when we bargained the contract for our firefighters, which is a larger number of employees. Uh, you will find that uh, the metrics are consistent as such. In addition to the economics, um, I believe this is one of our last bargaining agreements that encountered a retention incentive that we offered across our 22 bargaining units, so that part is included in um, this uh, package. Um, I do want to take a moment to hand over the mic here to uh, Chief Ann Bickle to highlight some of the department's efforts and uh, share, if you will, um, how that, yeah. our TA uh, was reached. Yeah, thank um, you, Chief. Just So one of the things that, oh, excuse me, Assistant Chief Van Bickle, thank you. Um, one of the things we had spoken about is there are more metro area fire departments nowadays that are going from the model of using volunteers and paid on call and they are now starting to go full time within the state. And we're trying to get ahead of this a little bit where we're seeing some of our newer people will come and then They'll get trained here, they'll work here for a year, year and a half, but then they're able to go to another community that has just started their fire department and make more money. And we did do this market adjustment, which I think it came out very well in what we're offering our city department or our fire department right now, so that we can keep the people that we've trained. You know, we invest a lot of time and a lot of money, so we do like to keep who we have when we have them. and. It provides for some continuity. It provides for safety for us to keep our people the way we have them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's all. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure there wasn't mm -hmm. any additional questions. Thank oh. you. Oh, no. Uh, right. I will open it up for discussion if any of my colleagues have any questions. Nope, I'm not seeing anything in queue. It's great to be able to have this um, in front of us as an agreement. Um, and with that, I will uh, move this item uh, forward for a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those not in favor, say nay. All right, the ayes have it, and this item passes forward to council. Thank you. All right, colleagues, we have one um, last item on our discussion uh, component of our agenda, and it is on 2023 data and trends for a 311 service center. Um, I will invite our staff uh, forward to give their presentation. Um, and yeah, super excited for this. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. 
Chair Wensley, Council Members, um, good afternoon. We are happy to be here to present our 2023 uh, data and trends for the 311 Service Center Department. My name is Mwende Mzembe and I am the director. Um, and I will start with going through a quick department overview, starting with our vision statement. So as you all know, uh, 311 Service Center Department is fairly new. 311 and Service Center were merged in April of 2022, 2023, sorry, last year, 2023. And that uh, is when our department started, that is when I started as uh, in my new role. And since then we have done significant work and we're gonna be uh, talking a little bit about it as we share the, the data and trends for 2023. Our vision statement is we aspire to be a leader in connecting Minneapolis's uh, diverse, growing, and thriving community to city services. And how do we do that is through our employees, through our technology, um, to make sure that we are growing a vibrant culture of in innovation, transparency, and ownership. Um, we envision doing this by building a stronger community one interaction at a time. Uh, given our business align, we uh, take calls, we have the centralized call center, but we also have the service center where we have the in-person interactions. And so by uh, one interaction at a time, we, will, we are connecting internal and external customers through seamless service. So our customers being um, the Minneapolis residents, but also city departments being our customers too, because we do not own any of the work, um, the departments own the work, and so we are doing it on their behalf. And as a department, as this new department, we are really committed to be a catalyst for significant transformation, a transformation that reinvents the way our city, serve, um, the way our city serves residents, and also it being a transformation that reinvents and improves constituent relationships. We have a new department um, org structure. Before we had uh, the 311 director was overseeing operations. Um, and also support uh, the support services, but now we have um, a manager of operations that is overseeing the 311 call center and the service center, and also we have a support services manager. Our operations manager is Brianna, Miss Brianna Phelps, and you'll be hearing from her shortly. She has been in this role for about six months now, and our operations manager is Mr. Antonio Elias, and he has been in this role uh, for the last three months. So that was the first task that um, we did once uh, the department was merged, um, is setting up this structure, but also ensuring that we are taking care of our staff, we are building morale, and we are providing the vision for what the new department is going to look like. Um, and at this moment, I'd like to call up Miss Brianna Phelps. Hi, just to quickly introduce myself, uh, Committee Chair Wansley, Council Members. My name is Brianna Phelps, as Mwende said, and I am the Operations Manager. Um, like she said, I've been in the position for about six or seven months, been at the city for about 14 years. I'm very excited to be uh, have this opportunity. And I cover both the operations of our 311 call center as well as our in-person service center. Um, so as you can see from the slide, we for the 311 side, we currently have three supervisors as well as a mix of customer service agents one and two. Um, these staff handle all of the calls that come into our 311 phone line as well as all emails that come into our, our general Minneapolis 311 email. So they are that first line of defense. They are taking all that information and then working through it. And then on the service center side, um, we have one service center supervisor and then our service center agents. And they um, handle all in-person customers and interactions in our um, primary location, which is our service center in the public service building over on the second floor over there. And then I'll let the manager of support services introduce himself. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Council Antonio Elias, and I'm the new manager for support services. Um, basically, we support the department in five main areas, um, business processes and systems, basically IT, quality insurance and reporting, data, um, outreach and engagement, um, training, and the last but not least, uh, constituent services. Thank you. 
Um, so I'll just give you kind of a, a brief overview of our 311 operations. Um, so as I mentioned, we have our 311 agents and then our supervisors. Um, currently we're budgeted for 27 um, 311 agents. We actually have 28 right now. We do work on bell curve staffing, which allows us to make sure that we are staying as full staffed as possible to maintain full coverage for all the calls and emails that we get. Um, and then of course the three supervisors. Um, our operations handle or work with and support all city departments. We are that conduit in between to help the callers and, and um, whether it's residents, it's a contractor that's calling into 311 and helping them provide information or get them connected to a department. Um, while we do try to do first call resolution, if possible, there are situations that need a subject matter expert. And in those cases, most often we are creating a case. We currently in our system have 238 case types that go to various teams and departments within the city. Um, and kind of interconnected with that, one of our primary uh, infrastructures that we use is our knowledge base. This is a really critical setup for us. Um, our knowledge base uh, currently has 1,454 articles in it, as well as it includes our scripting, and there are 676 scripts. I'm just kind of give you an idea of what those two items are. Um, the knowledge base articles you can think of as like a web page or Wikipedia. It's mainly static information that our agents can go through as they're working with a caller um, to make sure that they're getting all accurate information to the, the, what the person needs. Um, the scripting is more of a step-by-step -step guide. So the agent can work as they're talking to the caller. They can work through these different steps to make sure that they um, are getting the right information, asking the necessary questions, and it will lead them to uh, the correct kind of case that might need to be created. Um, if it needs to be a referral, maybe we're doing a transfer to another department or a different jurisdiction, um, or it'll also connect them with those articles. Because we have over 1,400 articles, the scripting makes it a little bit easier to find what they need. Um, a good example of this is um, when someone has, is calling to do a police report. There are very specific questions that we need to ask to ensure that we are making the right decision on if we enter that police report or if this is something that needs to go to 911 so that a police officer can come out and do the police report. So the scripting makes sure that our staff are asking all the necessary questions and getting all that critical information to make the right call. So Brianna was able to give you sort of uh, an explanation of some of the work that we do with, within our department. Now I'll be explaining how we do um, some of that work, but more specifically around business processes. Um, so the first thing we have here is what we call a uh, first call resolution. And the way that works is through our IBR um, system, which is an automated full system, right? And how that works, just like any autom uh, automated full system, is that you call our phone line. Um, once you call our phone line, um, you're going to be asked uh, to select the language, right? So we have four options, Spanish, Somali, Hmong, and English. After you select the language, the system is going to be asking you um, the reason behind your call, right? So after you state the, the subject, the reason of your call, the system will pretty much give you uh, three main options. Either one, it will uh, transfer your call to the corresponding department, or two, it will uh, transfer your call to one of our agents, or three, it's also um, gonna guide you or give you the recommendation to submit the claim or request in our uh, system online on our webpage, basically. Um, if for some reason the IBR system was not, um, was not able to give you the, the, the answer that you were looking for as, as a constituent, as a resident, uh, we submit a service request. And the service request is through our uh, software um, CRM system, which is called Legan, right? So basically how that works is we submit the request through the system CRM, that the uh, system will transfer or pretty much, yeah, transfer or delegate that request to the corresponding department. And the corresponding department has a specific period of time to address and complete that um, or resolve that request, right? And we're able to do that through our SLAs, which are our civil labor agreements, right? So every depends, every department has a different SLA. Um, um, I'm sorry, every case has a different um, SLA in terms of completion and addressing. So there's that. In terms of the challenge that we have for uh, the community to uh, approach um, our department, um, the first one is pretty much the, the most popular and the most obvious, our phone line. 
um, the email. With the email, you pretty much send us an email, and then the agent will follow up with uh, uh, back to the email, and then we'll give you a reference number or a case number um, in that case. And the last two are pretty much self-service in terms of one is uh, the online system, the web page. You go online and submit your, your uh, self-service uh, request. And then the last one is the mobile app as well. With the mobile app, it does have some uh, more specific features in terms of um, like taking a picture and then um, posting that as your uh, part of your uh, claim slash request as well. So there's that. Um, thank you. The next slide we have here is our 23 uh, uh, data overview. Um, here's some specific, um, here's some generic numbers, but in the next slide will be a more specific in terms of the analysis. But overall though, as you can see here, um, doesn't matter whatever channel the CUNY use, the numbers increase from 2022 to 2023. Let it be phone calls, let it be emails, um, let it be the mobile app or um, the web page. And this is the slide that I was uh, sharing with you, um, or that I was explaining in the last slide in terms of the percentages and the increase. So as you can see here, um, our phone calls um, in 2023 went um, up over uh, 10,000 more than 2022, right? In emails, we had a, a over 155 increase from 2022, and then the mobile app um, as well, there was an increase. Um, over a 50% increase from the last previous year, which uh, was 2022, right? Um, one thing to know here, uh, the second bullet point, um, out of the 334,000 uh, or more, the calls of emails received only 28%, uh, meaning 94,000 resulted into service requests, meaning that the IBR was not able to give you the answer you were looking for. So, you know, we had to submit that uh, request to address and complete that, that or close that, that specific request. Um, the list, last piece that we have here are some of the SLS percentage in review. Um, we listed those fours uh, that we have here listed, um, and those are currently in the review process that we are working with uh, the corresponding department um, as well. What we have here, top 20 cases, types, and description, um, and the left side, what you have here is the case type. And then on the right side, you have a description for that case, right? One thing to note here is this is for 2023, and this is citywide, not specifically per word. That's going to be discussed in the next couple slides. But again, this is citywide, um, top 20 uh, for, for the city um, last year. Now, this will give you more specific information. So again, case type, the only three things that we added in this one was uh, the numbers, right, which um, are really important here. But the case count per case, um, the SLA in terms of how many days uh, that needs to be addressed and closed, um, and the percentage within SLA as well per every single one of those uh, 20 cases that we have here. Um, again, this is citywide um, as well for, for last year. Now, top 20 cases, type trends by word. Um, the model that we use is uh, similar, so the information in terms of the order is gonna be, um, obviously it's gonna be different per word, but in terms of the model that we use is the same, uh, meaning for the word one for uh, President uh, Mr. Payne here, what we have is top 20 case type, types uh, for his specific word, and then um, the corresponding case count, SLA, and the percentage within SLA as well. Um, And then same process for uh, council member, um, all the pretty much all the council members. Um, I'm not sure in terms of what specifically you want to see or hear more in um, details here with this data. But again, the process was pretty much similar through all the council wards that we um, have here, the 13 councils, I'm sorry, wards. Channels by words, uh, this is uh, really key here. Um, in the next one, you will see um, on the left side is gonna be every single one of the words. And then uh, next to it will be the uh, total service request enter um, last year, 2023. Um, and that is added both phone calls and emails. Um, so that's one thing to note here. And then next to that, we have the mobile app um, and then the self-service cases. Um, the self-service cases, that basically what it means is the um, web page um, specifically. So individuals going online and submitting the, um, the request. 
And now I'll pass it over to Wendy. Thank you, At Antonio. So that, um, that's the data for each of the wards. So he started with an overview for the um, top 20 cases for uh, across the, the city, all wards, and then went down to each of the wards. And you know, so that's data that we will be meeting with each of the wards to discuss each of the ward um, uh, data to see what the gaps are uh, based on some of the other things, a, a couple of things I'm, I'm gonna discuss as we move on. So then after presenting that data, so what now, what, what is next? So for us as a department, uh, as we reimagine our services as, as a new 311 service center department, we're doing so by caring about what constituents are telling us. And what constituents are telling us is what we are seeing by this data. It's not just data. These are actual phone calls. These are actual emails. The residents are really reaching out to us. And this, uh, we really want to view it as the constituent voices. This is their voice. And so we have a lot of data, as you have seen, because uh, we, you get, all the ward offices get weekly reports um, that come out to you. And we also have the 311 dashboard. Our challenge for leadership in this department has been what are we doing with this data? Yes, it's out there, but what are we really doing with it? What are we doing with these voices of constituents we are hearing? Uh, rather than just being satisfied with, yes, 72% seven, of the time, as Antonio mentioned, when the constituents call, when we get the, the emails, we are able to resolve it. Our agents are able to uh, respond to their request, to the constituents' request, but then 28% of the time, we enter the service request because we need the department to do something with it, either send out somebody to go and prepare, uh, to go and repair a pothole, or they have, they're holding a stray animal that they need animal control to go out there. But beyond that, what is happening? So what we are proactively doing is following up with departments. Yes, our part, we have done our part, our agents have done their part, we have entered the cases in the uh, I, in the Lagan system. It's been passed on to department, but our work is not ending there now. As a new department, we are saying we need accountability and follow this data and how is it being addressed? How are these requests being followed up? And we know that um, to succeed, we have to design ourselves to be focused on openness and accountability. And this is what this data is doing. So in the last couple months, as we've been having meetings, um, leadership meetings, and also meeting with our management, we have been pushing that transparency will drive accountability. And we have seen that work as we start meeting with departments around what are we doing with this data. Uh, we also have a lot of data on the 311 dashboard work that started last year. And that has been very helpful because it's also been pushing us uh, towards accountability through that transparency with the data. Um, how are we using the data? We have already started doing some of these things and um, we're using the data to um, inform decision making. Um, previously, our department was not really known within the this, uh, enterprise, like what we do, what value we're bringing. So we are reimagining what our department is and educating um, the enterprise on the value that our department can bring in decision making through the data we have. Again, reminding everyone that it's not just data, these are constituent voices. Uh, the data is, uh, we're using it to prioritize and we can see uh, because we can, through this data, we can see what our customers are concerned about and determine what resources are most needed, both in our department, but also um, enterprise-wide by the other departments. Because we, we strongly believe that this data can improve visibility and management of services um, across the enterprise as city leaders obtain holistic understanding of the most common requests, as you have seen the top 20 requests, um, also understanding where they occur, looking at the breakdown by wards, we can see uh, you know, wh where, th th where this is happening. And also now we've added this other new component of where the city leaders will understand how quickly these requests are being resolved as you have seen with the percentages. This will lead again, as I mentioned, to better allocation of resources. 
Um, secondly, this, we're gonna use this data to triage and problem solve. Um, Antonio mentioned that 72% of calls and emails, we're able to resolve first call resolution. 28% we're creating service requests. We're asking ourselves why. Why 72, why 28? What is ideal? Um, and we are realizing that um, uh, our ideal would be if we had fewer cases created for the department to go out, but is that realistic right now? Do we have enough staffing to be able to um, answer all the questions that come in? Because as you have seen, we serve the, across the, we serve all departments. We have a lot of scripts, a lot of knowledge-based articles that um, our agents have to go through, and you can imagine the pressure as they're talking to um, the person on the call and they're trying to navigate through all this information, but also our training is taking a lot of time because we have to know about all departments, a lot of stuff about every department. So is it feasible for us to be able to uh, have 90% um, first call resolution? Is it, uh, when, if, if it's possible, what kind of staffing do we need to have to be able to achieve that? Because we know that that is ideal. Right now, uh, we are dealing with questions. That 72% is questions around, I want to pull a permit. How do I do that? Uh, agents are able to resolve that. Um, if it's uh, issues about uh, re uh, they need somebody to go out for snow removal or a street, um, icy streets, we have to send someone out. Those are the cases that we would like to ideally leave, uh, leave uh, for service requests, but things like callbacks, we want to be able to be able to answer those calls. But right now we still have some ca um, categories, as you'll see, that are callbacks because it's information that departments need to be able to call back and, and, and provide. So, um, so that's one way that we can, we're using this data. And then lastly, measuring effects. Uh, we want to be able to use this data to measure the effects of our programs. If, let's say, CPED or Public Works is pushing out a program and there's a um, public release that has gone out, if we're getting questions about that or people want to inquire more information about it, it means that the, maybe there's work that, you know, more the departments need to do more, there's information that they need to push out, or uh, if we're getting calls, is it because the information on the website is, is not sufficient and it needs to be out there. So because we know that the calls that we're getting is because there's um, information that is missing out there or there's something that the residents need that they are not able to get on their own. So that's one of the ways that we are using this data. Um, another piece of what now, we have the data. Uh, we, as a new department, we also, want to make sure that we are starting or starting to look at racial in, uh, equity impacts. This is something that we, uh, our departments haven't been able to measure. Uh, 311 hasn't been able to measure and it's something that we want to bring up because it's important to us. Um, through the My Minneapolis Mini survey, it's one of the things that, you know, it proved, we, we were already talking about it, but that also came to light that it's something that we need, but also because uh, Minneapolis residents are very diverse, we need to be able uh, to have uh, racial, be able to have measurable uh, racial equity impacts. Um, and the way we are proposing to look at this is through a collective impact. And what does this mean? We want to be uh, firmly grounded in accessibility, being data driven, working with a P, a performance management um, department um, to create benchmarks on equity work and also make sure that we are aligning with our city goals. As a new department, we haven't had the opportunity yet to work with them on our performance measurement, so that's something that we're looking at. Uh, we also want to implement a shared racial equity lens within the departments because if we put this in place just in our department and we don't have that shared equity, equity lens with other departments, we don't own the work we're passing on uh, service requests to them, so we have to be aligned with them. So it's not something that we can do on our own. It has to be something that we work with departments on. Um, increased collaboration and partnership with NCR and communications uh, with regards to um, 
serving our underserved communities, our communities of color, and making our services more accessible. This is something that we have heard, um, and we wanna make sure that we are addressing those gaps. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, the other piece around the racial equity impact is building relationships with communities and business organizations. And that's something that um, Mr. Elias has already started working on in establishing this these relationships. And lastly, um, quarterly meetings with other jurisdiction, other jurisdictions that are doing what we're doing because we've realized that we share a customer base. Uh, when people are calling about permits, they uh, work with uh, Hennepin County too, they work with City of St. Paul. And a lot of times when people, we have a significant calls actually coming to 311 or visitors to the service center who are actually, we're referring them to Hennepin County because that's where they need to be and they don't need to be at, at the city. So we have um, uh, scripts or knowledge-based documents for other jurisdictions. So really being proactive and being the first class leader city that we should be and uh, reaching out to these other jurisdictions to bring them together and have the conversation on how we can serve our residents and learn from each other. Um, again, under what now, we are doing a lot of work um, around, we've already started putting a lot of work in improving um, constituent services. Um, a couple months ago, about maybe a year and a half, there was a lot of conversation that was being had around constituent services. Um, and because of that, it led to a constituent, ser constituent services directive that was issued to the COO at that time and uh, city clerk's office, Mr. Crow. And, um, I think a lot of you may remember if you were still here that we had a lot of meetings enterprise-wide between the administrative side and the legislative side um, to address some of the issues because council uh, offices were getting a lot of escalations around um, city services and um, service requests that have been put in by, by constituents. So uh, fast forward to today, that work has been passed on to our department and so we are, we have formed a framework for it. We have a plan for it. And we are taking all those conversations, the many months of conversation and the information that we got to um, see how we can uh, move the work forward and elevate some of those issues. We went ahead and created what was, what we call the 311 Constituent Services Mailbox and working in partnership with uh, legislative liaison team, that's Zach Farley and Margot Meyer. And there's been significant progress because now we do not, we, we had a lot of emails coming in there based on escalations uh, to city council. And now I'm proud to say that we have maybe about two a month or three a month. And that shows the hard work that our team, our teams have put together in taking this seriously and addressing those issues. Uh, we're also having bi-weekly meetings with the legislative liaison team again, so that we can share ideas on what, uh, what offices are hearing, what we are seeing, what the, tr the data and the trends that we are seeing, so we can have conversations and share the communication so that if we are seeing a lot of trends around graffiti, we're letting, we're having these conversations and this information can be passed on to the ward offices so that you're aware that this is happening. So if you get calls, you're able to relay the same messages that our department is relaying to. So we are still working on that coordination, but we strongly believe this bi-weekly meetings will, um, will, will be part of the framework that moves and improves the relationship, the constituent services relationship between the city and our, and our constituents. So uh, we, based on the conversation and the, 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 what we heard from these meetings, we were able to come up with a project mission for this constituent services work, which very much aligns with our business line and everything that we are doing. So we are looking at improving our policies, our programs, our standards, and our systems to create best practices. This is in line with, again, reimagining the place of 
uh, the 311 service center department. So rather than being the department that just that uh, you know is a, is a one point of contact, and we are sending this request to departments, we are centering ourselves as being carrying this work and saying that we are going to lead and create best practices for constituent services, not just for our department, but for all city departments, and as we hold the other departments uh, um, accountable. That was the gap that was missing, where once we passed on the service request to departments, there's re there was really no one leading that work and creating that accountability mm -hmm. and looking at what next. And this constituent services work has enabled us to do that, and we are excited about it. Um, the goals for this project, uh, constituent services work, is not only going to help our department, but gonna help the, the, the work of the department too. Um, the first goal is to ensure that our residents and businesses have access to reliable, um, timely and transparent information. How are we doing that? Through staff training, uh, a lot of collaboration and partnership with departments. We are seeing more coordination and leading that. And um, also, as I mentioned, we're using uh, data for decision making. Second goal, we're improving uh, SLAs, responsiveness to our SLAs. One of the things that we, we came to notice as we're having discussions with departments regarding their SLAs is there was not a clear understanding of the expectations. So those SLAs that you'll see on there even ba uh, based uh, for with, with the ward breakdowns, um, some of them have been in existence for over 10 years. We, they haven't been reviewed yet. As we were having conversations with departments, there was not a clear understanding who is in charge of um, changing them. Uh, but now we are starting to set those expectations and telling departments that you own the work, you're the subject matter experts, you let us know what, um, what those service level agreements are. Because what happens is when a customer calls and they're reporting a porthole, we're telling them, with using the SLA that we have on file, let's say if it's 14 days, we're telling them that in 14 days, somebody is, uh, that is gonna be resolved. That is what we're telling them. So if that's not the case, we're telling departments, give us your updated SLAs. Also, we are considering emergent issues, seasonal issues, like we know, for example, um, during street sweeping season, there's gonna be a lot of calls about, you know, street sweeping, or even during snow emergencies, we're gonna have a lot of calls about snow removal. Um, and at that time, we know that departments will not be able to honor the current SLAs because they are backlogged. All these calls are coming in at the same time. So doing weekly reviews of data with departments is enabling us to be able to say, we, we're seeing uh, increased calls, your SLA says seven days, based on the volume, do you wanna change this LA and what makes more sense? Because we wanna make sure that we are giving our customers the accurate information. We have noticed that it doesn't matter if, they, if it was seven days and we exp we're explaining to the constituent that um, because yes, they know it's seasonal, uh, they, they are seeing it. So if we explain to them that, you know, it's usually a seven days, but now it's increased to 14 days, they don't mind it as long as we're honoring that. The problem becomes if we give them a, a, a time frame and we don't honor it, then it becomes a problem because we're getting repeat calls. If we're still not able to honor it, then it becomes an escalation. So we're working with departments to review this uh, trends on a weekly basis so we can, what we're saying is that the service level agreements do not need to be static. They can be fluid depending on what we are seeing. Um, so the other piece too with the SLAs is that um, we are, again, all this is being driven by data. As we're seeing the data come in, we're having these conversations with them. The other goal is reviewing uh, how city systems and technology can adequately support our work. This was a big topic during the constituent services meetings and I'm happy to report that um, we internally in our department, we have started uh, by, by monthly, monthly meetings to talk about us new CRM requirements. Um, and uh, IT, last, this month IT uh, CIO has identified a resource for us who 
is going to partner with Mr. Elias on a project for systems and technology where we'll start having enterprise-wide meetings with re uh, representatives from departments where we'll start collecting the requirements for our next CRM because our CRM right now, Lagan is very clunky, it's old, uh, but it, it's working the way it was supposed to work. It just cannot support our needs anymore. So um, this team is going to work on the requirements for the new CRM with a goal of uh, putting together an RFP and going out for bid in the fourth quarter of this year because funding has been identified for 2025 to get us a new system. But what we are working on is for it not to just be a three-on-one system, to be an enterprise system in alignment with our new vision for the department where we are, an, we're gonna be supporting in the best practices for this work enterprise-wide. Um, and also so that we can elevate some of these challenges where departments are not able to close their cases on time because they're out in the field and then they have to come back to their office and move the status of the case to closed. If we can have a system where they can bring either, um, it can be an app where they can, uh, after they either fix the pothole or do the work out in the community, they can go ahead and close it out there. It becomes even easier. So uh, issues like that that we've heard from departments, we're collecting that information and making sure that our new CRM has that. The other piece is our 311 app. Um, we want to highlight as you go through your uh, the ward data, the 311 app uh, has its own shortcomings. Right now, all the case types that you saw, the 238 are not in that app. We have very few cases, a few public, work, public works one and two reg services one. Uh, and you have seen that in that data, we had an increase of 155% from 2022 to 2023, which means it works really well. And it's very easy to use. We love the app, but we're not able to put all our case types on there. So that is a shortcoming. Um, we, and because we're going into a new system, we're not able to start doing that work right now because we're hoping that the new system will, will have an app that is encompassing too, so that it's one system, it's in one system. Right now we have, our system is by one vendor and our CRM is through another vendor. Um, increased partnerships with city departments. Again, this is a piece that I talked about accessibility and we are using data from, we're looking at data from each word to see the trends and asking the hard questions of why. Because if we're hearing from ward offices that there's a problem of maybe street lights, but that's not being reflected in our data, then the question is why is that not being reflected? And that means that we're not getting the calls that we need to be, we need to be getting. That means to me that there's a problem of trust in the system or the process. And so residents are not feeling comfortable or feeling that you know, it makes sense to call. So we are not adequately representing them or the needs of certain words. So our goal, our goal is to reimagine our outreach um, and how to improve trust in our process, right? Uh, as you saw the increases in the different channels or the, 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 the different channels, we've, uh, th uh, since April, we've done a lot of outreach, but we need to reimagine how we're doing that outreach rather than just going out to events and having a table and talking about what we do we're now gravitating towards um, bringing our services to the community as part of outreach. So rather than just having the table, we'll be there, yes, have a table, but be providing the services. People can walk up to us and file a complaint. Or the stuff that we do in, in our buildings, we'll be able to do it out in the community when we go out to do outreach. Uh, that way, when we have that face-to-face -face contact and our residents see what, what uh, we're doing and we have conversations with them, we'll start building that trust um, and other ideas that have come up too. And then our last goal is to develop an enterprise-wide training program in the same lens of us being, our department being that department that is leading this work enterprise-wide. Uh, once we figure out all these things and improve um, um, our continue looking at our SLAs and all that, our goal is to create an enterpri enterprise-wide training program where 
um, it will be in Comet. We'll work with HR for it to be in Comet and where we can train all city departments that are working with residents on what the expectations are around service delivery, about equity, about accessibility, and all that so that they can be a clear understanding of what customer service or constituent service delivery is, not just for 311, but that the entire city will have a strategy and our best practices as the city of Minneapolis. These are the expectations when working with uh, Minneapolis residents. The last slide is just um, a visual of what we have started doing um, with these this five goals that, um, that I just explained in detail. Uh, we have the processes and standards work group that um, this one is mostly internal. It's the whole of our management team is meeting weekly and reviewing scripts, um, seeing what the gaps are in those scripts, what hasn't been updated in a while, view, reviewing the SLAs, and then based on that, we're going back, we're then meeting with each of those departments and um, asking the questions about the SLAs. We see that your percentage has constantly been 70%. Your um, SLA time is five days. What is a problem? Does this mean that the five days is not working anymore? Uh, do you need to increase that? We need an accurate representation and us helping them with these conversations around that. Uh, we've currently reviewed a lot of scripts, 100, about over 100 scripts, and we are we are looking at um, being done sometime in the towards the end of the second quarter with the 636. Then we have the systems and technology group that I mentioned that is going to be starting to look at the CRM. This one is going to be ex ex uh, moving quickly because we have the RFP slated for end of. Um, this quarter, the 311 dashboard is already ongoing, and um, we have the online engagement platform. This is new work that we are going to be looking at uh, creating a citywide looking, piloting at creating a, a citywide engagement platform. And then the last one is a training program. In the middle of it is a project team that is going to be led by um, Mr. Elias. And uh, the, all this work is now being done by my department uh, ourselves. We have partnered with what is called, we're calling it an advisory committee that is made up of uh, the department heads from NCR, IT, um, communications. We have the legislative li liaison team there and the mayor's office constituent services so that it's a comprehensive citywide effort um, as we get buy-in and understanding on how to move forward together with this work. 168. We've reviewed 168 scripts. Right, thank you. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Director, for giving uh, a very comprehensive uh, presentation on our 2023 uh, 311 data trends. Um, I had asked or requested this presentation um, because I know often, as you highlighted, uh, 311 is kind of like the undiscovered gem at the city enterprise in terms of, you know, just a significant amount of work that you all do to support both the legislative department, us as council, along as uh, the administration and being effective in our jobs. Um, I know for me, the reason why I led on sidewalk plowing pilots was because of the data that was represented around sidewalk plowing as complaints across all uh, the city and recognizing this is such a helpful data source and, and that can be used in developing policy and again, funding uh, measures to make sure that we are providing the highest quality services to every single resident, regardless of where they live in the city. Um, with that, I will open up uh, the queue for any questions. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Councilmember Cashman. <laughs> Thank you, um, Director. This is amazing. Good work on your team and look forward to hearing all the results. So you did mention, I have two questions. One, you mentioned it, the project has like five layers and goals. What is the timeline there um, in the short, like what's the, the first steps in medium term, long term? And then also, I'm wondering if you have data on a map. You know, do you use GIS at all to, not just by ward, but actually more specific levels? So, 
you know, we can identify hotspots in our ward for certain issues where we could take up um, policy proposals to correct issues happening on different blocks or in different areas of our ward. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, Chair Wansley, council member, uh, thank you for your question. I will um, answer the first question about the timeline for the, for the five projects. So it's not linear. It's all happening at the same time. Um, I will say that we are looking at um, the processes and standards that's reviewing the SLAs that's going to be done, we're looking at getting done this year, actually before the end of the third quarter. So that is an ongoing process um, for this year. The systems and technology, as I mentioned, um, we're already studying that with the goal of going out to RFP in the fourth quarter so that the, implement the developing and implementation work can start in 2025. Um, the 311 dashboard is already underway. That is an iterative process as we, s we uh, continue identifying more data that needs to go out there and that kind of stuff. The online engagement, we are looking for, a uh, for two pilot projects to work on. Uh, we have, uh, our IT team is leading this and we have identified two, but we are yet to, the advisory group is yet to review them and finalize on how we're gonna move forward with that. And then the training program is gonna be at the end uh, of it all. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm expecting that that will be sometime in 20, towards the end of 20, 2024, uh, early 2025. And then the question about the GIS. Uh, committee Chair Council, just to add one more thing. Um, we actually do have a diagram with uh, the specific quarters like Q1 to Q4 throughout the whole year with the specific um, goals that we are um, achieving for every single one of the work groups. We don't have it in the presentation right now, but if you want to see that document, you know, we can follow up with that, that uh, um, data as well. Um, so. Perfect, thank you. Um, and I'll have um, Ms. Rebecca Sandell answer the next question about the GIS. Chair Wansley, Council Member Cashman, um, thank you for the question. Uh, currently, we have on the constituent services dashboard um, a breakdown up to the neighborhood level, and we will be working with IT to um, go into um, further dot maps, things like that, um, within the next year. Thank you so much. Thank you, and yes, it would be great if um, you all could work with the clerks uh, so that we could get a committee-wide memo sent out with the information about the, the quarterly kind of timeline. That would be awesome. Thank you, and then you're also, I will take myself off and let Council Member uh, Ellison go before me. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just wanted to thank you all for the presentation, and um, <clears throat> certainly a lot to dive into, but I, I think, uh, Mostly just wanted to thank you all for the work and for, you know, I know there's been a lot of questions uh, with government structure changes, with, you know, all of these things about how do we do this kind of direct constituent service delivery. The city of Minneapolis, we, we are a service delivery, delivery mechanism. That's what the whole city enterprise is designed to do. Um, you all and, and, and 911 are the, are the closest connection that the average person has to the services that the city provides. And so just wanted to recognize that and, um, and to see sort of the amount of work you guys are putting into making sure that, um, you know, uh, changes in government structure or changes in how things are going uh, don't just become, you know, a place for excuses, but become a place for innovation and become a place to, to dive in and improve uh, uh, your ability to connect our residents to the, the services that we provide. Um, uh, I think it's really, I think it's awesome. Uh, it was great to see uh, the presentation um, and um, uh, excited to see how the work continues to evolve. So thank you all, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Council Member Ellison. Um, I had just a, a few questions, actually like 1.5, um, but, um, in thinking of you know how you're reconciling the the challenges of 311, you know yes being the lead, but also working in tangent with the departments who are actually in charge of closing um, service requests. Um, I'm really interested in examples, and you you gave a, a hypothetical one, but um, if you could provide an example of a time where you know a significant volume of 311 calls caused the 
department to shift the way in which they deliver a program or operate it? Chair Wansley, that is what we're working on right now. Okay. And that's the gap that I talked about that we identified where we, are, we were not shifting uh, with the requests that were coming in. We were still working on the on the SLAs that we had, and that, that's, that's not working clearly because then it results to all these um, callbacks and multiple callbacks by residents asking why we haven't delivered that. So what we are encouraging departments, and they are actually excited about it, is rather than just be static, have uh, we need to review, as we're reviewing mm -hmm. the weekly data and we're telling them, now we're able to see, oh, this week, um, Solid waste and recycling was the most, uh, the most calls on solid waste and recycling. So we're having a conversation with them and asking, have you noticed this? What is happening here? Uh, is this SLA still working? What do we need to change so that we are, we are making sure that we're giving the accurate information? So that's what we're working on now, and that's, that's what we're, we're trying, the shift that we are making right now. So we, uh, we don't have any examples where it has worked uh, you know, in the past. It's something that we are starting right now. And as we're, we, as we're looking to do the quarterly reports, we'll, we're excited to start seeing those shifts and start reporting on them. Thank you. Um, oh. uh, and Ms. Feltz has <laughs> an example. <laughs> You've seen that? Yeah. Um, uh, committee chair. Uh, the example that uh, happened actually relatively recently, probably in the last six months since I've been here, um, is streetlights. Mm -hmm. um, so streetlights have had, uh, the department's had a lot of issues with the wiring being stolen. And the wiring being stolen is causing significant delays in how quickly they can get those streetlights back on. Partly because the quick answer is to replace that wiring, which then gets stolen again and it's, it's not solving the problem. So they've put in a ton of work to find how can they update this, change this, and find a solution so this doesn't keep happening. The problem was is it was really pushing out those SLAs. Mm -hmm. So um, we worked with that group to say, great, we, can, we super understand. You guys are also behind because you're working with these thefts and maybe a lights out that isn't a theft, but now you're dealing with everything all at once. So we worked with them to figure out how can we make adjustments the, so we're giving accurate timelines to customers, rather it's a wire theft or it's just something else, or maybe we don't know we're going to have an extended timeline. So that was something that more recently we worked with that department and were able to kind of update the information to match so they had the time to work on what they needed to work on. Awesome. Thank you for providing that example. Yep. And then uh, the point five uh, question, you had actually answered this earlier of just the languages um, <clears throat> that are accessible through our 311 system and knowing that you all are prioritizing um, increasing engagement with communities of color, also um, for communities where English is not their first language. Uh, yeah, can you reshare those or restate those languages again? For sure, um, Committee Chair Council. So it's four languages, Spanish, Somali, Hmong and English. So once you select the, the option, then the IBR system will obviously give you the information in your corresponding language that you selected. So. Awesome. Is Will there be efforts to do also like a, a language review as you're doing your engagement and thinking of so maybe there might be other languages that need to be added? Uh, community Chair Council, yes, so that's part of our engagement and outreach process. Um, and we actually, just to give you a more specific uh, example with NCR, um, but even more specifically with their um, EDR, uh, EDA, I'm sorry, uh, team with Guthrie, we meet on a monthly basis as well to pretty much share any updates in terms of the work that he's doing and vice versa, just to make, just to make sure that we're both supporting each other, but also discuss the items that, you know, uh, need to be verified and, and addressed in terms of language and accessibility. So, um, and the same thing with their, I mean, community engagement liaisons and team with um, Mariano and, and um, that team with uh, Nick and then going and whatnot, so. Okay. Awesome, yeah. thank you. And then I see Council Vice President in Q. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Director, um, and, and your team, thank you for this presentation. This was so thorough, um, and I feel like in every um, in every 
slide that you covered where you were, you know, sharing information about um, the the process that you were going through. Um, you just like covered all of the information that could, I could have possibly asked a question about. So just really, really appreciate how thorough you are in covering the content that you're sharing with us. Um, and it, you know, it speaks to the work that you do. You interface with residents, you know what kind of questions um, are, are popping up in, in people's minds when they're not the subject matter experts on something. And so I just can't thank you enough for your presentation and um, all of this information that you shared. I will say that my favorite day of the week is the day the 311 reports come in. Um, I review those very, very extensively um, to be thinking about what are the types of questions our offices, our, our office is going to be receiving if we're going to be out in um, community or if I'm, you know, going to a, a neighborhood association or, or anything like that. What are the types of patterns that I should be prepared to speak to? Um, so, like that's a that's a the data the the 311 dashboard, which you know I think was rolled out. It took council offices sometime last year. Um, along with those reports, are just such an important part of us being prepared to better support and service our residents. Um, and and you do that all the time. I mean. I think it's like close to 12,000 Ward 10 residents that, that um, you worked with last year. Um, the couple of very quick questions I have for you, I hope, um, are first um, just what is your, how do you track um, like repeat customers um, and or like repeat um, calls about the same issue by, by customers? I would... Uh, community Maybe chair council. Yeah. Well, I would say the community chair and council. If anything, um, they, so they have a case number or a reference number, uh -huh. um, and that's how. I'm not entirely sure if we actually um, track in terms of, you know, uh, if that same customer calls again and again. But they, every single every, every single one of the cases do have a specific ref reference number that they can refer to. Um, but we'll have. Um Ms. Sandel, she's one of our call analysts, and yeah. Chair Lonsley, um, Vice President Chuck Tai. Um, yes, so there is a mechanism within our login CRM that allows for us to track repeat callers. Um, to Antonio's point, if they are calling <coughs> in about the same issue multiple times, the other mechanism we have is uh, if another caller calls in about that same issue and the case is still open. Mm. If the case is closed, we're going to create another record. Um, so that would be a means of tracking that. As far as reporting off of that, it gets more difficult, so we don't really have reports that speak to it. But on a case-by-case -case basis at this point, that is something where we can call up those numbers. Awesome, thank you. Um, and then, I, I really really appreciate and, and like that um, you are thinking about um, you know like addressing some of these um, common concerns at a systems level and, and meeting biweekly with um, with people across the enterprise to, to be thinking about beyond logging a concern um, and being able to provide accurate information about when their concern might be addressed or when they might hear back um, thinking about like how do we change the system, so that this isn't a concern that a resident um, that residents are calling us about uh, regularly, um, and and you mentioned the legislative liaison team, um, it w is that like with the the team within um, the clerk's office that's uh, supporting constituent services work? Mostly, the reason I'm asking is I want to know how can we, as council members, when we when our offices are hearing about. Um, you know, I called 311 and I haven't, you know, I, I, I had a negative experience with the outcome. How do we communicate that so that information is getting back to you, knowing that you're work, trying to work on that at a, at a systems level? Chair Wonsley, Council Vice Pre President Chikta. Yes, so the legislative liaison team is Mr. Farley and Ms. Meyer. That, those are the two that we need. Uh, we've seen a lot of benefit in doing that because rather than having to reach out to all 13 
ward offices when we're seeing these daily trends and letting you know that expect this, they're able to liaise with all of you and let you know what we are seeing. But we also are expecting the same feedback. So if you're having similar concerns or there's some concerns that you're getting, if they can be passed on to this team, we're meeting bi-weekly and we can come up with solutions and then uh, the solutions can be distributed to all board offices. But again, you can also reach out to any of us too. Uh, we're open to assist as needed. Awesome. Thank you just very much. And just to add a uh, constant council member, um, Nick, um, losing his last name um, from the mayor's office, he's part of the, that. Uh, yes, he's part of that um, um, team as well. So he, he's part of the conversations as well. Awesome. Well, thank you both for, again, giving such a thorough uh, presentation. You really set the bar here. Um, and I don't see anyone else in queue, so I will um, ask the clerks to uh, file uh, this report. And committee members, it seems that we've concluded all of our business here today. So if there's no objections, I will adjourn. Oh, sorry, actually, before I do that, um, just a heads up. Uh, our next uh, AO meeting, we will be uh, discussing and overviewing the AO work plan. So that will be the moment to bring amendments, um, questions. Um, I am thankful to every council member that provided a submission. Um, and we are excited to bring something forward that incorporates those. Um, as many folks know, um, every committee right now is working on work plans that will guide um, their respective committees and this body as a council and how we're being responsive to, you know, the top of mind issues as, you know, what was even pointed out in our 311 uh, presentation. Um, so I'm really excited that for this week, uh, public health and safe safety's work plan is coming forward. And then AO and I, the, I know a number of standing committees that budget has already passed. Um, theirs, we're going to keep doing um, this work. So I just want to give that heads up uh, so folks can be on the lookout for LAMS when it's uploaded. Um, but with that, I for real, for real adjourn this meeting. So, all right. <laughs>